Well, good morning, church, and welcome to Alive Fellowship Church. Well, I'm in a series that I started last week directed at why is the church important? Why do we need the church? Uh, God's desire for the church, the marks of a of a uh, an effective and successful church, reasons to come to church, right? How to give it over when you've been hurt in church, things like that, unity in the church. And so we're doing a series on the church. Now, last week, we talked about how to be an irresistible church. And the bottom line of being an irresistible church is to be willing to serve, to touch a person with our hearts and our hands, to, to show them uh, that God loves them, and that we would simply be irresistible. So, as I think about the church, as I think about our church, I think it's important to know uh, God's desire for the church. What's God's desire uh, for our church? Well, let's get started. If someone asked you to list the characteristics of a New Testament church, what would you say? I began thinking about that, uh, about what God wants our church to be like, and as I was praying and, and studying, I put together some characteristics that I believe should be characteristics of every New Testament and church. Now, when I think about a church in the New Testament to base these characteristics on, uh, I thought about several churches in, in the Bible. I thought about the church in the book of Acts, and we, we looked at that in a very, very small way uh, last week. The church in Acts gives us a picture really, of the history of the church, uh, how it got started, how it began to grow. I also thought about the church uh, in Ephesus. Now, that gives us really the doctrine of the church. Uh, I thought about the church in Corinth, right? In Corinth, and they are a pattern of what the church is not to be. But then I remembered the church of Thessalonica. What a fantastic church uh, it was, and it's a church that we could pattern our church after because it was everything God intended the church to be. One of the exciting things about studying uh, this church and the letter that Paul wrote was what God does not focus on about this church, right? Uh, about the church in Thessalonians. Uh, when you talk about what God wants the church to be today, a lot of people will determine the success of a church by the things that God never even mentions. God, you know, we would come up with things about, hey, that's a successful church. And God never even mentions those things. You know, God doesn't talk about <clears throat> the size of the church. Uh, how many people are there on Sundays? God never talks about that kind of stuff. Uh, nothing about the programs, right? Uh, nothing about uh, the kinds of sermons or the music they sing. Nothing about, well, how big are the buildings? How nice are the buildings or whether uh, the parking lots are paved or not? Nothing about the kids' ministry or worship service. Uh, maybe somebody uh, in the nursery. Now, all of those things are important, yes, today, but God doesn't focus on that. Th th this letter does not tell us a lot about the internal things of the church. You see, when the Lord takes the temperature, temperature of the church, He sticks that thermometer on the inside, not the outside, to see if people are hot, cold, or lukewarm. Well, when the Lord took the temperature of the church of Thessalonica, of Thessalonians, it came out super hot. This spiritual church in Thessalonians is on fire uh, for the Lord compared to the rest of the churches around it. This church gives us a great pattern and a great picture to follow and to learn. We will extract and choose some of those characteristics. So I want to give you a little bit of background on this church and really how it got started real quick. In Acts chapter 16, Paul starts his second missionary journey with Silas. They stop in uh, this town called Derby. They get Timothy. They take him with them. And in Acts 16, 19, Paul has this vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come to Macedonia and help us. He goes first to Philippi, where he meets Lydia, the seller of purple. Uh, she gets saved. She accepts what Paul is talking about, the way. Her household also gets saved, and, and they start something there. Like most places Paul went, uh, persecution arose, and Paul and Silas, they kind of get thrown into prison. They're beaten. Uh, that's where we have the story of the Philippian jailer being saved. In Acts 17, it begins to show us that Paul leaves Philippi, and he stops. Paul stops at Thessalonica because it's a very large city and it's located in a very strategic place. Now, in, in Paul's day, the population was probably around 
200,000 people, most of them would be Greeks. And that city still exists today under a different name and a population well uh, above that. Now, I want you to see something <clears throat> as we begin, because I think this is important to understand. Take a look. In Acts chapter 17, verse 1 through 4, the Bible says this. Paul and Silas then traveled. They're heading there, right? Paul and Silas traveled through the towns of Amphipolis and uh, Apollonia. They came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. So this is how they get there. Now, you might be asking, why did he pass those other two towns? Why didn't Paul stop at those two towns before he got uh, to Thessalonica? It was not because Paul didn't care. Paul didn't have a burden for those people in the city. They need to hear the message of Christ just as, as much as anybody. It was because Paul's call was to minister in the larger cities at the synagogues, and the believers from there would reach out into the smaller towns. And so Paul's plan of attack, uh, which, is, uh, which is very similar to every place that he went. Now, I want you to see verse 2 because I think verse 2 really does a great job that kind of pours water onto the argument that church is not important today as some people believe. That ah, come and go. It's not that big of a deal. You know, it's just not that big of a deal. Some people believe that. This verse to me really fights back that kind of attitude, that kind of spirit. Take a look at verse 2. As was Paul's custom. So this is Paul's custom. This is what he did. This is what he did all the time. As Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue. He went to the church. He didn't go to a home. He didn't, he didn't go to, to this place over here. He went to the synagogue service and for three Sabbaths in a row, he uses scriptures to reason with the people. And so it was his custom to go to church, to go to the synagogue so he could tell other people about Jesus Christ. Yes, then they would take that message and start and get moved out. And they would be, certainly be meeting in homes. It says in verse three, he explained the prophecies and proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. The Bible says that he used the scriptures to reason with them. The word reason means to dialogue. Maybe you got some questions and answers explaining. So Paul would probably read something, explain its meaning with reference to Christ and the gospel. How, uh, how He would uh, show them in a very orderly manner how it was all uh, in, in, in perfect harmony. And Paul did not simply teach. He proclaimed Christ and asked for a decision. So I think we can learn so much from Paul's approach to sharing the message of Christ. He used the Word of God. He declared the Son of God as the Messiah. And he started where people were and led them to the truth of the gospel. And then verse 4, it shows us uh, the results of what he is doing. Some of the Jews who listened were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. And so he's sharing this message, he's sharing Christ with them, and a lot of people are persuaded to go, follow uh, the way. What an awesome message. People putting their trust in Christ uh, and, and following Him. But just like today, we know that not all will believe. And he addresses that in verse 5. But some of the Jews were jealous, so they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob, start a riot. They attacked the home of Jason, searching for Paul and Silas, so they could drag him out to the crowd. So from there, Paul and Silas go somewhere else, uh, and then they leave. They go uh, from Athens to Corinth, where Paul was uh, when he wrote Thessalonians. So uh, here's where we get to the principles that I want to show you. Paul sends Timothy to find out how the church is doing uh, in Thessalonians. And it says this in 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, that is why when I could bear it no longer, I sent Timothy to find out whether your faith was still strong. So he starts his church. He's got this church in Thessalonians. He sees it. He, he's dying to know how the church is doing. What's going on in that church? And so he can't stand it any longer. So he sends Timothy. He wants to find out if their faith is still strong. It says this, I was afraid... Now watch that the tempter had gotten the best of you and that your work had been useless. Paul was worried and afraid that the tempter had gotten the best of this church. 
that maybe they were, they were, they were on fire, but then the tempter comes along and it kind of takes it down. So, so Timothy obviously brings back a good report, and it says this in verses 6 through 8. But now Timothy has just returned, bringing us good news about your faith and love. He reports that you always remember our visit with joy and that you want to see us as much as we want to see you. So we have been greatly encouraged in the midst of our troubles and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, because you have remained strong in the faith. <clears throat> Excuse me. It gives us a new life to know that you are standing firm in the Lord, he says in verse, in verse 8. You know, what a church. Paul is just blessed. He is blessed because this church is continuing to stand strong. So today, I want to look at that church to see uh, what they were doing so well and let it be a characteristic of our church and what God wants our church to be. So with all of that being said, let's, let's, uh, let's go. I believe there are seven <clears throat> characteristics about the kind of church we should be that we can learn from this church. Uh, here's the first one. It was a saved church. There, will pe there are people there who believe in the message of Jesus Christ. They believed in the way. How do we know that? Take a look at verse 1. This letter is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. We're writing to the church in Thessalonica, to you who belong to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says to those of y'all that belong to Him. If you're going to belong to God, you have to be a believer. They were believers. They put their trust in Jesus Christ. So one of the patterns of this church is that they, they believed that they were believers in Christ. Now, I, I know that that may not sound very profound, and, and it may not, but it's very important for us today. You see, the Scriptures make clear that toward the end of times, there will be a great apostasy, the, the basically the abandonment of godly belief. And most churches will not be preaching the gospel. And if you're not preaching the gospel, then you don't have genuine believers in your church. Well, that's not the case here in this church. He says this, we always thank God for all of you and pray for you constantly. Paul could thank God for them because they were believers. God, thank you for the people accepting you as Lord and Savior. Verse 3, as we pray to our God and Father about you, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of Jesus Christ. Now, this verse gives us evidence of their faith. They had faithful work. They had loving deeds. They had an enduring hope. Individually and as a church, there ought to be some evidences of our faith. Faithful work, loving deeds, joy, encouragement. Now watch. Just because you do something for God doesn't mean you're saved. But if you are saved, there will be evidences by what you're doing for God. God is going to bless that kind of church. With that being true, we understand that Satan's going to do, do his best job to get people not to believe in Christ. You, you know, you know what, what I believe? Satan's desire would be that the church is just full of lost people. Not that lost people would come to hear the message of Christ, but that that's all that's there. Hey, I, I don't care if they get together each Sunday. Man, just let them get together. But I don't want them talking about Jesus. Uh, whatever they do, I don't want to talk about Jesus. And whatever you do, don't believe and don't put your trust in Him. We know that not everyone who comes to church has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Matthew chapter 13 even tells us there are weeds among the wheat. We, we get that. We understand that. Our job is to always preach until people believe. The first characteristic of this church is that they preach Jesus and people believed. They were saved. They were believers in Jesus Christ. Here's, a, here's another characteristic. Uh, they were a separated church. They, they, they set themselves aside. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. So you receive the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of uh, severe suffering it brought you. Now watch. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. I want to focus on that. Uh, in this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. You see, the moment they got saved, they began to imitate Paul and the Lord. They began to live differently. They, they, they began to live a separated life. 
You see, these believers just didn't talk about Christianity, but they began, they, they began to live Christianity and imitate Christ. It's, it's that entire principle of the old and the new. And, and let me show you uh, a quick uh, uh, a principle. Paul says, you imitated me. You imitated me. Now, isn't that a little prideful when you think about it? You imitated me? Paul knew that people, by nature, are imitators, and baby Christians are no exceptions. Big question, and this one hurts. If you led someone to Christ, would you be able to say, imitate me? Would you be able to tell your kids, son, honey, imitate me? Whether it's in serving and giving, your language, coming to church, how you're living. If there is one thing that the Bible makes clear is that Christians are to live differently from the world. They were not only believers that they put their trust in Jesus Christ, but they were living differently. They began to imitate Paul and the Lord. Romans 12, 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that He's done. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. A living and holy sacrifice. In verse 2, don't, don't copy the behaviors and the customs of the world. Be different from the world. Live a separated life. Live a godly life. The purpose behind living a separated life from the world is clear, and that is to bring glory to God. It's a witness to the world. Remember, all of us, we speak from the platform of our life. We always want to be salt. We always want to be light on a hill. We don't want to lose our testimony. Now, because they were a safe church, and they were living a separated life under God. They were imitating Paul. They were being obedient and all of that. They were doing what they should have been doing. The next characteristic kind of falls in line is that even in spite of that, they're believers. They believe in Jesus Christ. They're living separated. They're, they're imitating Paul and God, right, and the Lord. Uh, they were also a suffering church. Now, I want you to see something. Verse 6, 1 Thessalonians 1. So you receive the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. Just because they were saved, just because they were living a separated life, didn't mean that they wouldn't have problems. Even in the suffering, they were doing it. The church didn't have it easy. But any church that has saved people and they are living separated lives, they're not going to find it easy anywhere in this world. I believe even most Christians have a hard time possibly understanding this. We, we forget that it was the religious world that persecuted Christ. John 15, if the world hates you, remember, they hated me first. They hated me first. The religious world cannot get to Christ, but they can get to us. So it's, it's not uncommon for the lost world and the religious world to hate us as Christians if we stand as we should. So whenever a church takes a stand on the truth of God's Word, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer. And church, let me just give you a little interesting fact here. Remember, believers living a separated life, and even in spite of that, they are suffering. But let me give you a little interesting fact. Did you know that the only church that the Lord said nothing negative about. So we're talking about the Lord saying something negative about a church. The only church that the Lord said nothing negative about of the seven churches in the book of Revelations, watch this, was the church of Smyrna. That's the only church that he did not say something negative about, right? And, and why? The one thing it says is that because they were a persecuted church. They were a persecuted church. Saved separated, and you're still going to suffer. Number four, it was a soul-winning church. Verse seven, as a result, you have become an example to all the believers in Greece uh, throughout uh, both Macedonia and Acacia. And now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere. So the people are going to share the word, even beyond Macedonia. For wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God, and we don't need to tell them about it. So they're not having to tell them. They're, they're telling uh, Paul and them about their faith. 
for they keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from idols and served the living and true God. What causes a person or a church to become a soul winner, to care about people enough to tell them the message of Jesus Christ? It, it's so, is it so you can come and have a, just a great time at church? And some would say that. Would it be because of just great programs? No, no, no. The reason we want to be soul winners is because we want them to know that there is a Christ likeness. This, this church was a soul winning church because it wanted to be like Christ. You see, it does no good to tell somebody about Christ if we're not an example of what we're saying. And so Paul tells them they have become an example to all believers. Look, these people grew up in a, in a polytheistic philosophy, the belief in multiple gods. So one day they get saved, they, they quit believing in many gods, they begin to believe in the one true God. And because of how this church was, the word of the Lord was ringing out to people everywhere. You know, when you think about it, you and I should be an echo of the word of God. Never our opinion. How could a church that is only a few months old have such a tremendous testimony? They were telling others about Christ. They were inviting them. They were telling them the way. They were telling them about the message. Uh, there's another characteristic, just a few more. Number five, it was a second coming church. First Thessalonians 1.10. It says this, And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus. A great quality of a church is one that is looking forward to Jesus coming back. You know, a lot of churches never say a word about the coming of Christ. So I'm going to do a series uh, on basically the second coming of Christ at the end of times later uh, this year, and it's going to stretch me. And, uh, and so I ask that you would even now begin to pray for me to be able to share God's message in truth. Now, why is this important? Why is it important to be a second coming church, to make that also a focus? Why is it important? because it will motivate a church to get busy and serve the Lord. If we knew when the Lord was coming back, we'd be telling people all the time. Revelation 22, uh, 12, Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. When Jesus comes, He's going to reward all of those who have been faithfully serving Him. Service done out of love for Christ. Not because you get anything. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd rather have His rewards than anything in this world. Uh, I want to have him say to me, well done, my good and faithful servant. And 2 Corinthians says, because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. So a church that does not believe in the second coming of Christ has no sense of rewards. There's no urgency of, of judgment to those who don't know him. Number six, not only was it a second coming church, it was a standing a uh, fast church. Take a look at these verses. So we have been greatly encouraged in the midst of our troubles and suffering, your brothers and sisters, because you have made uh, remain strong in your faith. It gives us new life to know that you are standing firm in the Lord. So when Timothy brought the news to Paul that this church was, was standing strong in the middle of a persecution, uh, for Paul, it had to be just almost like salvation all over again. He was encouraged during the trials and pressures that he was going through. It lifted him up. It lifted him up because of how they were living. Now, what does it mean to stand firm? I believe it means two things. First, it means you don't move off of doctrinal truth. If you're going to stand firm, you don't move. You stay up on that wall. You don't move on doctrinal truth. You don't compromise the truth of God's Word. And second, it means that you, you stand fast in His love. You, you want to build a great church like this one? And we always speak the truth, and we do it in love. So this church, they were saved people. They were living a separated life. Yeah, they were going through some suffering and hard times. They cared about other people uh, hearing and knowing the message of Christ. They, they looked forward to the second coming. They were standing fast. And the last one, uh, and I'll close with this, is they were a submissive church. How do we know that, that it was a submissive church? Here's how. You will not find any other book in the Bible where Paul makes so many unqualified, undefended, and unexplained commands about the kind of a great church they are. In so many other words to other churches, 
He qualifies so much. What do I mean by that? Well, like the church of Corinth, he would say something and then he would spend some time explaining why he said it. Why? Because they were doing something wrong. They were carnal. This church was not. And he did the same thing when he wrote the book of Romans. So they were being submissive to God's word. It's almost like there was nothing he could say negative about. Can you imagine standing in front of this kind of church? You could say something like 1 Thessalonians 5.16, always be joyful, and you could be done with the sermon. Thanks thanks for coming to say today, guys. 1 Thessalonians 5.16, always be joyful. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next week. Because you knew that they would go and they would be joyful. So we need to soak up God's Word so much that we become so submissive to it that every time we are faced with something, some new doctrine, something comes our way, we're able to sift through it and use God's Word as the absolute authority. That is the Spirit that God will bless. You see, our church is made up of you. So let me close by asking a simple question. Are you saved like the people in Thessalonians? Are you living a separated life? Are, are, are you willing to suffer knowing you're going to? Do you care about family members and other people that need to know Christ? Are you looking forward to when Jesus comes back? Are we standing strong in truth and His love? And are we living a submissive life? That is the kind of church we want to be. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be together today. I ask that you would continue to bless all the churches, the Father, that are teaching the truth in love. The Father, we would care about people's hearts and souls and where they will spend eternity. And so, Father, we tell you that we love you and we thank you. In Christ's name, amen and amen. Hey, look forward to you joining us again next week as we continue this series on the church. God bless you all. Have a great week, and we'll see you soon.